starting off our list today at number 10, we have Ben Affleck. Okay, so we've all been wondering what happened between Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez at the Grammys. Well, thanks to Anna, a seat filler, she took to her TikTok to address what was going on between them after Ben was spotted looking not so happy during the ceremony. Apparently, Ben was looking a little gloomy because he wasn't really happy that he was going viral for his facial expressions. Ben was really upset at the fact that he was going viral again as previously the actor and director went viral for the sad Affleck meme a while back. Anna in a video continued to say he knew during the performance that he was a meme like he knew and he also chose just not to change his expression and also went on to note that she didn't know the meme of Ben Affleck being an upset at the award show and she didn't speak to him while she was seated beside him because he didn't look so happy. Number 9, Trevor Noah. After this year's Grammy, a girl named Pan exposed a bunch of celebrities at the Grammys and how they acted throughout the night. Now it's no lie that celebrities don't want seat fillers to sit next to them because they don't want any of their drama at their table to be revealed. So they do give them a bit of a hard time when they do try to fill empty seats so the tables don't look empty. When Pan sat down in one of Beyonce's seats, Beyonce's bodyguard, Julius DeVor, even told her to leave the seat, which resulted in her taking a seat that Trevor Noah was in. While she was sitting in the seat, she was sitting beside JLo. Just when the commercial break started, Pan noticed that Trevor was making his way back over and when he arrived, he told her to stand up. When she did, he quickly sat down and started greeting JLo, which left the fan in a position where she didn't know where to go. Hey my little peaches, are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Coming number 8, we have Jennifer Lopez. While Anna was exposing what happened between Ben and JLo, she would explain that Jennifer was on her phone and realized that her husband was going viral for his expression. When she shared the news with Ben, he wasn't so happy about the trend. To the point when Jennifer showed him the phone, she said, Honey, this is so funny, look at this. He responded by saying, Jesus Christ. So we all saw that video where a lip reader was hired by the Daily Mail that alleged that Jennifer told Ben to stop, look more friendly, and to look motivated. However, Anna claimed that the whole time the couple was actually super dovey and they had their hands intertwined and that it was really cute and while she was sitting next to them it actually wasn't what the Daily Mail was making it out to be as she said she wasn't like oh my god this is going to lead to a divorce as she thought they were cute and she had a great time sitting next to them for the time that she was sitting there for. Coming in number 7, Ariana Grande. Terry George, the man who was mistaken for Billy Eilish's grandfather at the 2020 Grammys seemed like he had a lot of fun that night as he was adopted into Billy's entourage. However, one star didn't rub off so nice on him. When he had the opportunity to speak about the event, he let it know who it was. During his interview, he said he was having such a great time with Billy that he even got to pose for photos with the singer. However, one person who wasn't so keen on taking selfies with him was Ariana Grande. When Terry was asked by Insider if Ariana was acting like a bit of a diva, he would respond to the outlet by saying, yeah, she was. He then went on to say somebody had gotten up and said, oh, I'm gonna get a selfie with Ariana Grande. And that's when he thought that it would be good if he could get one as well. However, when Terry finally made his way to her to ask for a photo, she refused and told him, not right now, I'm not in the mood. Terry also went on to note that she didn't win an award that night, so that's probably why she was so upset and acting like a diva. Number six, Louis Capaldi. Louis Capaldi never got exposed at the Grammys, however he did once get mistaken for being a seat filler at the show in 2020. While the star was a nominee for his song Someone You Loved, the musician's big award show moment was interrupted when someone confused him for being a seat filler. According to Louis himself on Twitter, there was a bit of a mix up at the ceremony when he said, a lady at the Grammys has just come up and offered to take my seat because she thought I was one of those people who sits in chairs to fill them when someone gets up to use the bathroom. Lewis didn't have any hard feelings regarding the awkward moment and appeared to enjoy the ceremony just the same. The singer didn't go on to share anything else about his Grammy experience that night. However, he did share a pre-show peek of himself in the bathroom for all his fans to see. So he was clearly having fun. Number five, Demi Lovato. Demi Lovato opened up about her time on the network to Harper's Bazaar in March 2020 and it 
admitted that they had a hard time with the Disney workload, which as a kid was likely way more than normal. They covered themselves at first by saying, quote, I'm grateful for the opportunities that I got. But despite that, they also said, quote, do I wish that I'd had more downtime? Yes. I think when you are a teenager and you're given your big break, you'll do anything to make it happen. I do feel that a lot of the ways some of my life was handled and lived led me to kind of having a bit of a downfall just because I was so overworked and I wasn't dedicating enough time to my mental health or my personal life. Now, while she didn't so much speak about the restrictiveness of the network like the other stars have, she spoke more about the effect of imposing a celebrity lifestyle onto a growing human being. And in a separate interview with Billboard from 2016, Demi joked that they had PTSD after leaving the channel. They added, quote, we joked around that it was Disney high, except we were all shooting shows and really overworking ourselves. Number four, Selena Gomez. Just like a lot of other Disney stars, Selena Gomez, who got her Disney fame from being the main character of Disney Channel's Wizards of Waverly Place, felt that her time at Disney started to paint her as someone who she wasn't, like almost everyone else on this list. When speaking with the New York Times in 2015 about moving away from that image, she said, quote, I'm growing and changing. I was in a relationship and I was being managed by my parents and I was still under Hollywood and Disney. And I was being held to this expectation of being the good girl. She continued, I knew deep down that this wasn't what I wanted to do. Being exhausted, forcing something that wasn't right, even in my personal life, I had to have moments where I was crying and I was like, why am I not in love with what I do? I was forced to get very uncomfortable for a while in order to make the decisions I made. Now, while that seems pretty much par for the course here, quite some time later during the Television Critics Association press panel in August 2021, she elaborated on what I personally think is the main issue with becoming a Disney child star. She said, quote, I signed my life away to Disney at a very young age and I didn't know what I was doing because you know, she was a kid. Number three, Coco Jones. Coco Jones starred in the Disney Channel original movie, Let It Shine, which is where she found her primary Disney Channel successes. But she also had recurring roles on two Disney series, So Random and Good Luck Charlie, competed in Radio Disney's The Next Big Thing singing competition, and signed with Hollywood Records music label, which is owned by Disney. But then, kind of as soon as it all started, it began to unwind. In a 2020 YouTube live stream, she revealed that a Let It Shine sequel was planned, but that it was canceled for reasons completely unknown to her. She was also apparently supposed to get her own show, which also never came to be. Hollywood records, though, seemed to be the main cause for concern here. They dictated what the celeb could wear, say, and sing, and the people that the network supplied her to work with wanted her to sound, quote, sellable which is a term that is up to interpretation by you guys. She put out a few singles and an EP, but right before her actual album was supposed to drop with the record label, the label dropped her. And apparently they told Coco, quote, we don't know what to do with you. At that point in her life, she was homeschooled after dropping out to make Disney and her career her priority. Afterwards, she understandably dealt with depression, but with the support of her parents, she graduated high school early and moved to LA. Going forward, she booked the role of Hilary Banks on Bel Air, signed a new record deal with High Standards and Def Jam recordings, and dropped her major label debut single, Caliber. So good job. Number two, Ashley Tisdale. Another heavyweight Disney star, Ashley Tisdale played Sharpay Evans in Disney's high school musical trilogy and in her own spin-off, Sharpay's Fabulous Adventure. She also played major roles in The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody and Phineas and Ferb. Now, after the first high school musical movie, which if you don't know, was huge, Ashley joined her castmates for high school musical, The Concert. While on the tour, which itself must have been both a dream come true and a nightmare with all the scheduling and little downtime, she also performed her own original song, He Said, She Said. However, similar to the experience that Jonas Brothers had, Disney made her change certain lyrics. In a TikTok, Ashley said that Disney made her change the line, kissing like that, to dancing like that for the tour. The original lyrics were, baby, I can see us moving like that. Baby, I can see us touching like that. Baby, I can see us kissing like that. We don't need no more, he said, she said. But while I get the image that Disney is trying to uphold here, I don't believe changing an artist's original work is fair. Just take the song out in its entirety. That would have been my idea. I think that would still not be okay. So just like, I don't know, leave it alone. And finally, in at number one, Alison Stoner. You may recognize Alison Stoner for her supporting roles in actually quite a few Disney Channel productions, like The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, Camp Rock, 
Camp Rock 2, The Final Jam, and Phineas and Ferb. I remember them best from Cheaper by the Dozen, but that's just me. They have been one of those few Disney Channel veterans that has actually tried to make things better for other stars going forward, and they've been pretty vocal about some of Disney's shenanigans. In a 2021 YouTube interview, Allison said, while traversing extreme peaks and valleys of global fame, hidden medical hospitalizations, artistic milestones, rapid adultification, and multi-layered mistreatment I wish on no one, I narrowly survived the toddler to train wreck pipeline. That's a hell of a way to describe surviving Disney. They went on to say, as someone who lived it and witnessed thousands endure alongside me, I can attest that what is missing from the pipeline narrative are clear action plans for intervention, long-term prevention, and accountability from studios, agencies, and guardians. Unlike other stars, Allison turned their experience into ideas to improve the safety and well-being of other children in entertainment, such as requiring studios to have a mental health professional on set, improving child labor laws, and making media and industry literacy courses mandatory for guardians and representatives. One of my favorite quotes from the celeb, though, goes like this, quote, if we disrupt and heal the toddler to train wreck pipeline, we won't need another cautionary memoir. And that's actually helpful. At number 10, we have Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt had several odd jobs before he made it as an actor. While Chris spent some of his time living in a van in Hawaii, the star could be found working as a babysitter, a server, lawnmower, and he was also a stripper. Chris would tell BuzzFeed in 2013 that being a stripper allowed him to be free and to make money while he was doing it, and he was never embarrassed about being one. After all, he did get his job at the age of 18 after he auditioned to become one. He also revealed that he even stripped at a grandmother's birthday party for $40 back in the day, and while the star has gone to call himself an average dancer, the grandmother definitely appreciated the gesture. At number 9 we have Channing Tatum. Now, fans of Channing Tatum are aware that the actor was an exotic dancer before he starred in movies like 21 Jump Street and Step Up. Before Channing rose to fame, he used to perform at a strip club in Tampa, Florida. A video sold to US Weekly in 2009 showed Channing dancing for guests who were clearly pleased. In 2011, Channing would sit down in an interview with GQ and he would explain that he was never ashamed nor did he regret one thing about being a stripper back in the day. He also states that he doesn't miss anything about stripping. The star would strip in front of 25 girls and said there was nothing glamorous about it whatsoever. However, Magic Mike would definitely prove otherwise. Are you enjoying this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And number 8 we have Courtney Love. Courtney Love earned her success as a solo artist as a lead singer and guitarist in the 90s rock band Hole. Aside from being married to Kurt Cobain, Courtney was popular for releasing hits such as Malibu. However, while most know Courtney for her hit singles, many don't know that Courtney used to work at Jumbo's and Seventh Vale as an exotic dancer. The singer used to make around $300 a day, and she would be able to use her earned money to help her fund her band. However, the singer has stated that due to low income, that she did have to be extremely financially savvy before she was able to make it as an artist. At number 7 we have Cardi B. Now, if you search Cardi B on the internet, it will give you endless results about her career and how she started. However, it's clear Feel that this star is definitely living her best life and we're all here for it. Her hit song, Bodak Yellow, definitely didn't make it a secret that she was actually a stripper before she decided to change her career path to become a musician she is today. At the age of 18 after losing her job, the star decided to become an exotic dancer after the person firing her told her to do so. When she started, she knew she was going to make money and that the career was going to pay more than any other. The star would then quit dancing by the time she was 23 and would then become a global icon in rapping. And number 6 today we have Azealia Banks. Rapper, singer, actress and writer Azealia Banks began her career on MySpace back in 2008. Later that year she would be signed to XL Recordings when she was just 18 years old. However, her breakthrough wouldn't come until 2011. And her single 212 would break the internet and enter several international charts. However, before she started her music career, Azealia actually used to work at the strip club. Azealia even said that she used to work at the strip club and it was her lowest point but she needed money fast and she felt like she was such a chicken in the strip club. And it wasn't her thing at all and she was actually only there for two weekends and then quit because her song 2 on 2 blew up. Next at number 5 we have Phil Collins. When I found out that actress Lily Collins is the daughter of singer Phil Collins, I had to sit down for a second. Because Collins is a very common name. I never thought they were related. There was barely any association with the two to begin with so you can't blame me for being shocked. Now that is 
isn't to say there wasn't any type of Nepo baby privileges that came unnoticed, but clearly Lily managed to have a career in her own name. We'll talk about her Nepo privileges another time. As it turns out, she isn't his only successful kid either. In total, he has five children, including Lily, and most of them are successful in their own career paths. His eldest daughter, Jolie, started her own production company. His eldest son, Simon, is a musician taking after his father's profession. Simon said that Phil provided his earliest music education by giving him albums to listen to. His fourth, Nick, is also looking into a musical career and started his own band called Better Strangers. As for his youngest, Matthew, it's a mystery, but there's no doubt he has an endless supply of connections in the entertainment industry if he really wanted. And he's still young, so he has time. At number four, we have Snoop Dogg and Brandy. The two cousins, yes, you heard that right, cousins, have their own successful music careers spanning decades. In case you've been living under a rock, Snoop Dogg is a rapper with a personality higher than life, if you know what I mean. Whereas Brandy is a singer, songwriter, and actress most known for her R&B sound and for playing iconic roles such as Cinderella. Usually when we find out that celebrities are cousins, it tends to fall on the distant cousin type of way. But these two are actually first cousins. Their respective music careers were always separate as they never used each other to boost themselves within the industry. That's because they didn't need to as they both managed to create their own solid fan bases throughout the 90s. But finally in 2009, Brandy was featured on Snoop Dogg's 10th album, Malice in Wonderland. They collabed in his song titled Special, where she provided the vocals for. Next on the list, we have Andy McDowell and Margaret Qualey. Some fans of the Netflix series Made didn't believe it when it was revealed that the mother-daughter duo on the show were mother and daughter in real life. Most of it came from their names, clearly as Margaret's stage name doesn't take after her mother's. But nonetheless, they were praised for their believable chemistry on the show, which now makes sense. Andy reassured fans that while there's so much tensity on the show, their real life relationship is very different. Unlike the animosity and toxic relationship between their characters, Andy and Margaret are actually really close. She also shared how they spend a lot of time together anyways, so being able to work around these new types of emotions with each other wasn't very hard. And before you scream nepotism on Margaret, you'd be right, but instead of booking the role via her mother, it was the other way around. Margaret had already secured the main role and suggested to the showrunners that her mother be cast alongside her. At number two, we have Steven Spielberg and Jessica Capshaw. While they're not blood related, they definitely are a family a Hollywood family at that, with Steven's more than obvious big name in the industry, and Jessica known as the infamous and beloved Dr. Arizona Robbins from Grey's Anatomy. And no, they're not married. Steven is her stepfather. Kate Capshaw, Jessica's mother, is his second and most recent wife, and they're still married to this day. They met in the early 90s on set of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which he directed because, duh, and Kate starred in it. It was reported that despite having these big connections, because her stepfather father is literally the biggest director of all time, she decided not to use them and paved her own way. She got her Bachelor of Arts degree for English Studies and then enrolled herself in a prestigious performing arts program in London. Now whether Steven had some role in getting her into these schools is unclear, but seeing as many don't know they're associated together like that, I think not. And finally at number one we have Michael Sarah. Last year it was revealed that he and his wife Nadine became new parents. Well it was less revealed and more so exposed by Amy Schumer. It was an accident, but Michael confirmed it days after her interview was released. Michael was known for keeping his personal life private, as his wedding was low profile too. The only reason people realized the two were married was when they were spotted wearing similar wedding bands on their fingers. And even then the media came to a conclusion that they probably got married sometime in 2018. All we know about their kid is that he's a boy and that's pretty much it. Michael did open up more about how being a father changed his life in more ways than one. He said it changed his perspective on life as he became a real family man. In an interview he said, so when I was 20 I would have been way happier to go off to some weird city and live in a hotel for three months. And when you have kids, you want to be with your family and you miss them a lot. Coming at number 10, we have Kim Kardashian. The theme for the 2022 Met Gala was gilded glamour. And for Kim Kardashian, this meant wearing one of Marilyn Monroe's dresses, which happened to be the dress that Marilyn wore when she sang happy birthday to President John F. Kennedy. Then later there would be conflicting reports that started to headline the media as they claimed
claim that she damaged the dress that she only wore on the red carpet because it didn't fit her correctly. And then she changed into a replica dress inside the event which led us all to question why did she have to wear the original to begin with. While Ripley's did claim that the dress was damaged beforehand and Kim never damaged the iconic gown, before and after photos would prove otherwise. Not to mention she also repeatedly bragged about her weight loss to fit into the garment. In the end, Moreau's fans were extremely upset that the fact Kim used part of the late star's legacy for this and historic preservationist even were upset that the dress was damaged and critics of diet culture were angry about Kim's harmful dieting tips. Number 9. Kendall Jenner It's clear that Kendall is not someone who spends most of her time in the kitchen. During an episode from her family's new TV series, The Kardashians, the star would expose herself after she proved that she's probably never used a knife to cut her own vegetables a day in her life. In a now viral clip, Kendall could be seen in the kitchen wanting to make herself a snack in front of her mother, Kris Jenner, who awkwardly sat there dumbfounded when Kendall attempted to navigate what most can do before they're even a legal adult. At one point, you can even see Kris was concerned for her daughter's fingers when she cautiously watched before saying, do you want the chef to make you a snack? Instead of holding the knife with her dominant hand and the cucumber in her other, the model reached her arm over the knife to grip the opposite side of the vegetable and then proceeded to cut inward, directing the slices to fall towards herself. While most would chuckle at an offer of professional hired chef, being called in to simply chop up a cucumber for a 26 year old woman. After witnessing Kendall attempt to do it on her own, it was pretty sad. Hey my little peaches, are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Number 8. Doja Cat So do you remember the time when Doja Cat slid into Noah Schnapp's DMs just after season 4 of the hit Netflix series Stranger Things was released? While many of us were crushing on Joseph Quinn who played Eddie Munson, it appears that Doja Cat wanted to get him before anyone else did, so she decided the best way to do it was to slide into the DMs of Joseph's co-star, Noah Schnapp, to see if Joseph was single and then proceeded to ask Noah to send her a link on his Instagram. The internet then began to rage as Noah is still considered a child and Doja is a full grown woman. Noah then responded by sending Doja the link and then he decided it was too weird so he read the DMs out loud for for his TikTok fans to hear. In the end, Doja Cat would then be furious that Noah decided to expose her and described his actions as him being a borderline snake. Eventually, Noah did have a good laugh and he did apologize to Doja Cat for exposing the video and then he went on to delete the video. But not before the internet called out Doja Cat for being 29 years old and messaging a 17 year old. Like, come on, Chrissy, just wake up and realize that wasn't okay. Number seven, Adam. Levine. Back in September, Adam Levine would be plastered all over the headlines after model Sumner Stroff exposed Adam Levine in a series of shocking TikTok videos. Just shortly after Adam and his wife announced they were expecting their third child. In the video, Sumner would claim that she and Adam had an affair and she even provided screenshots of their conversations as proof so people knew she wasn't lying. In the beginning, Adam would then try to deny the affair and he took to his Instagram to write a statement which said, I use poor judgment in speaking with anyone other than my wife in any kind of flirtatious matter. I've not had an affair, nevertheless, I crossed the line during a regrettable period of my life. Sumner clearly wasn't happy with Adam's statement, and then she came out with another TikTok video to claim Adam even asked her if it was okay to name his unborn child after her. And she urged for someone to get him a dictionary so he could look up the definition of cheating. Number Number 6. Ned Fulmer Adding to the storm of cheating scandals on September 27th, the internet content creators known as the Try Guys would announce that one of the members who happens to be Ned Fulmer would be leaving the groups following reports that Ned had an affair with one of his employees, Alex Herring, after a Reddit user shared now deleted screenshots of a video that appeared to feature Ned making out with the Try Guys associate producer at a bar in New York City. As the clip started 
started to circulate around the internet, more videos and photos would also start to circulate of Alex and Ned on dates that looked pretty intimate and people who posted the images even said they sent them to his wife because they were concerned. This would then force the Try Guys to post a statement which said Ned was no longer working with the Try Guys as a result of a thorough internal review. We do not see a path moving forward together. Soon after the announcement, the Try Guys even switched out their profile picture of all four members with the company's official logo across Instagram and Twitter before making an additional video statement clarify that they were blindsided by the news of Ned's behavior. Number five, Jason Biggs. In the early seasons of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on Nickelodeon, Jason Biggs could be heard voicing lead turtle Leonardo, but scandal quickly erupted at the network when it was revealed that his social media activity was offensive enough that there were many calls to Nickelodeon to protest his involvement with the show. So in 2014, after only two seasons, he was ultimately replaced by Seth Green on the popular series. And for a good reason. Jason's Twitter in the 2010s was a PR nightmare. In fact, there didn't seem to be any topic too controversial for him to joke about, like a bachelorette contestant who died, a plane crash, the Pope, women's basketball, and sexually explicit comments about the politician Paul Ryan's wife. But the jokes backfired big time when the official Ninja Turtles Twitter account gave a shout out to Jason's personal account and encourage their followers to check it out. It's safe to say that the kid friendly and PG network is not pleased with the immense backlash that they started receiving from parenting groups and conservative bloggers, eventually leading them to release a statement apologizing, while Fox News host Megyn Kelly called the American Pie actor a disgusting pig and called for him to be fired. Ultimately, the network responded to the pressure and gave Jason the boot. Number four, Angelique Bates, the actress who was one of the original original cast members on Nick's sketch comedy show All That exposed the reality behind the cameras when she spoke to The Shade Room in 2016. Angelique explains some of the horrors she endured such as physical, emotional and mental mistreatment from her mother in front of producers who not only turned the other cheek but strongly urged her to just accept the violence and remain silent. She said that she was only 12 years old when the nightmare began and that the producers and cast members could hear her yelling but nothing was done to help her. According to Angelique, League Child Protective Services did eventually show up in 1996, but she said that the adults on set pressured her to stay silent. Possibly in an attempt to muddy the waters or save her own skin, Angelique's mother, Dee Bates, came forward in support of her daughter, although she tried to shift the blame onto the network. Whatever the case with her mother's questionable side of the story, the former child star also explained that she was pretty much released from her contract at age 15 and claimed that she was blackballed by the entertainment industry as a result. But to this day, Nickelodeon have never come forward with an official response to the accusations. Number three, Victorious. Canadian actor Avon Jogia had his breakthrough role playing Beck Oliver in Victorious. But after Jeanette McCurdy's bombshell allegations regarding Dan Schneider, fans really started to question whether or not he had the the same experience. In a recent TikTok video, Avan admitted that he did not actually remember filming the series at all because he was blackout drunk almost every night. Quote, when you don't remember a single plotline to a single victorious episode, but you do remember going out partying every night. When one fan added that the show seemed like a fever dream to her, Avan just said, me too, and I was there. And when another fan asked, so Beck was hungover all the time, he just said yes. This admission was significant because in Jeanette's new memoir, she talks about the creator pressuring her to drink while she was underage, allegedly saying, quote, the victorious kids get drunk all the time. The iCarly kids are so wholesome. We need to give you guys a little edge. Sometime later, she claims that Schneider got into trouble with Nickelodeon for inappropriate behavior with the young cast and was not allowed to be near the actors anymore, meaning that he had to direct them from a separate control room. So it's entirely possible that he was creeping on more than just one actor. Number two, Jeanette McC Curdy. The iCarly star recently released her new memoir, which has been described as both heartbreaking and hilarious. The blunt title, I'm Glad My Mom Died, shocked fans upon its release because it reveals what really went on behind the cameras, something that up until now fans have only been able to really speculate about. Jeanette exposed her traumatic experiences on Nick and the disturbing truth about how she was mistreated by her mother, who pushed her to be a child star, noting that her own persona that she was known for throughout her youth and her young adult life was all all the front 
forced upon her by her mom, who in addition to everything else was extremely physically inappropriate with her. Jeanette also discusses the perils of young fame and reveals that she developed an eating disorder as a child and talks about why she ultimately quit acting altogether. She also goes into great detail of numerous instances where she felt exploited as an actor both on and off set, describing the creator as mean spirited, controlling and terrifying. The former Nick star recalled a time when she was filming an episode of iCarly that he insisted that she wear a bikini instead of a one piece swimsuit which she was much more comfortable with. Number 1 Drake and Josh This show was one of the most popular shows on Nickelodeon in the early 2000s. Starring Drake Bell and Josh Peck, the sitcom was one of the network's most successful projects from that time. So when the truth finally came out, fans were understandably left disillusioned and upset. Nobody knew that behind the scenes, Josh heavily struggled with addiction. Looking to feel better about himself, the actor explained in an interview that he lost 127 pounds in an 18 month time span while filming the show. But when that didn't bring him happiness, he admitted that he turned to alcohol and illicit substances for help. But that was nothing compared to the revelation that his co-star was caught grooming young fans. In July of 2021, Drake Bell pled guilty to attempted endangering of children and disseminating harmful materials to juveniles after a young woman came forward and accused him of predatory behavior. The 19 year old who chose to remain anonymous claimed that he began talking to her when she was 12. The actor managed to get away with two years on probation and 200 hours of community service. But at 36 years old, Drake Bell's reputation is now irreparably tarnished. Number 10 is Joe Jonas. Jonas Brothers Joe Jonas spoke with Wonderland Magazine in May 2019 about the struggles of being a Disney Channel star alongside his brothers. Joe made it clear how Disney was a saving grace for the trio when he said, quote, when we were getting started, we were in a position at one point where we were without a label and we didn't really know what the next steps were going to be. And Disney reached out with a huge opportunity for us to be signed by them and work on a TV show. This was kind of a saving grace for us in that point of our career, and we jumped on that opportunity. But still, Joe went on to say, quote, as you get older and you're a young adult and you're still on the Disney Channel, that can feel a little uncomfortable. Creatively, you can feel like you're a little boxed in and you can't really expand and grow. Lyrically, what you're going through in that time in your life, you have to protect your audience by only writing what Disney would approve. It was a little bit tricky as we got older, that's for sure. But that's just the music. While chatting with Vulture way back in 2013, Joe called out the Disney Channel for its apparently terrible writing and strict rules for their film projects. He said, quote, it just ended up being some weird slapstick humor that only a 10 year old would laugh at. They took out the kissing scene that Nick had. I had to shave every day because they wanted me to pretend like I was 16 when I was 20. When the show was done, I cut my hair off and grew as much of a beard as I could. We went along with it at the time because we thought Disney was our only real shot, and we were terrified that it could all be taken away from us at any moment. Now that is the truth of the matter. Disney child stars are all terrified of having Disney pull the rug out from under them, but that will become more obvious as we continue on. At number 9 today is Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus was probably one of the most popular of the Disney stars with Hannah Montana, where she played a dual life. While the popularity of her show is a huge reason for her popularity, now, that doesn't mean it's all peaches and cream. Speaking with Marie Claire back in 2015, the actress and singer explained how being Hannah Montana impacted her mental health, saying, quote, I was told for so long what a girl is supposed to be from being on Hannah Montana. I was made to look like someone that I wasn't, which probably caused some body dysmorphia because I had been made pretty every day for so long. And then when I wasn't on that show, I was like, who the F am I? That really spells out the effects of being a child star. In a February 2019 interview, on the RuPaul What's the Tea podcast, Miley elaborated on her disillusion with herself when she said, quote, I didn't really get to be a kid very much because I worked so much, but I wanted that. Since the last record, my last record was called Younger Now, and it says, even though it's not who I am, I'm not afraid of who I used to be. That was my epiphany. Number eight, Dylan Sprouse. If you weren't aware, Cole and Dylan Sprouse were two Disney Channel heavyweights with The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody and The Sweet Life on Deck. But instead of the network pulling the rug out from under them, it was actually the twins that turned their back on Disney. For some pretty understandable reasons too. Dylan Sprouse revealed the real reason why he and his twin brother, Cole Sprouse, left the network while speaking with Vulture in December 2017. Dylan spoke about how the pair had quote, a really awesome idea for where the show needed to go. But when they brought that idea to the higher ups at Disney, their idea was ultimately turned down. Speaking on 
that in the same interview, he said, quote, We were 18. If that isn't old enough to know exactly what the show needs, then, well, I would beg to disagree. I don't think Disney were willing to work with us really ever, so we stopped the show. And honestly, that's kind of punk as hell. Stick it to the man, Dylan. Good job. Number seven, Bella Thorne. Bella Thorne may be one of the most outspoken ex-Disney stars. During a February 2021 interview with Fox News, she said, quote, there are definitely a lot of pressures in the Disney eye to be so perfect, and I think that's where Disney, in a sense, goes wrong, because they make their kids seem perfect. That image is very difficult. It's also never been me. I always just like to do what no one else is doing. She would go on to say, quote, little kids growing up don't need to see perfect people. Kids need to see real people. They need to see diversity. They need to see intriguing. Bella opened up about another Disney instance during a podcast interview, which is completely different, called High Low with M. Rada in December 2022. Recalling a time when well, quote, I almost got fired off the Disney Channel because I was 14 and I wore a two-piece on the beach. According to her, there was a fan that got a photo and when that photo went into the World Wide Web, people began to put Disney under pressure to fire the actress. She said, quote, obviously Disney didn't fire me, but also they were like, hey, we're getting a lot of heat for this. Everyone's getting a lot of heat for this because you're in a bikini on the beach, which is when apparently they said, quote, so she needs to make sure she goes out in board shorts and a loose t-shirt next time she's at the beach. She continued on, quote, they said, you're lucky Bella has such a fan base that we can't afford to fire her at this moment in time, but if she does one more other thing, we'll fire her. But I didn't even talk about when a Disney casting director also fired Bella because they thought the 10 year old was flirting with them. What even is that? What? Number six, Stephanie Scott. While she had released music and acted a little bit before her time at Disney, Stephanie Scott played the role of Lexi Reed on Disney Channel's Ant Farm from 2011 to 2014, which won her a second Young Artist Award and introduced her to a wider audience. While on Disney, she also recorded a bunch of Disney Channel promotional singles, which were released between 2008 and 2012. However, despite her success and time with Disney, in a 2015 interview, interview with BuzzFeed, the actress threw some major shade at the network. She claimed that her role as Lexi Reed forced her to quote, sugarcoat everything all the time. She said quote, that's one of the hardest things, not being able to express myself in a certain way or being stuck having to promote something or say something I don't believe in. It's kind of hard after a while when you are feeling things and having a rough time in your personal life and you can't express your emotions through your work. Which heavily echoes the feelings of the other stars on this list. Stephanie explained quote, I wanted to tell stories of troubled girls where everything isn't perfect all the time. I didn't want it to stop there and be labeled as a Disney girl. I quickly realized I wanted to do more. If you've been on a Disney show, people target you as being the sitcom funny girl who can't take herself seriously and doesn't really have true emotions because they have to be perfect and pure, not shattered and torn in any way. Number five, he's immortal. A celebrity's birthday party. It's some of Hollywood's most exclusive events. You really gotta know someone to get invited to celebrate their birth. At Leo DiCaprio's 48th birthday, a number of A-list celebrities were in attendance. LeBron James was there, Rami Malek, Scott Eastwood, Mario Lopez, people who seemingly have nothing to do with Leo. Except one thing. You see, there's a dark corner of the internet that's dedicated to the idea that Hollywood elites are actually in a cult and make sacrifices to keep themselves rich and young. Leo is definitely on the list of possible members, not only due to his activity in the climate change community, literally trying to alter the air, but his never aging face. Many older actors in Hollywood have young faces. Just look at Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd hasn't aged since 1991, which must have been when he was inducted as the leader. There is some evidence supporting this theory. Leo only dates younger people, and famously, younger people are popular for sacrifices in film. His so-called friends are all frozen in time, and let's face it, some of these people sold something to someone to magically gain their fame. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Casey Affleck. Number four, bad friends. The Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation auctioned off dates with two of Hollywood's biggest predators at their annual fundraising auction in 2015. YouTube won't allow us to say these people's names anymore or show their faces, cause that's just how terrible these people were. So to help put a face to the situation, uh, they were two of the men that were brought down by the Me Too movement, they were like the first ones, and one was a producer for Quentin Tarantino, the other one was the lead of House of Cards. So for the purposes of this list, we will refer to them as Jabba the Hutt, and 
Spaceman. Should be pretty easy to differentiate the two. The foundation auctioned off a chance to spend a year working and enjoying private time with Jabba and Spaceman. In hindsight, this is one of the weirdest things a person could bid on. It doesn't matter who the people are, you're basically just paying to have famous friends for a year. Leo brought these men back for this event several times. Now, while it was before the allegations of their misdeeds were confirmed to the public, Leo was very close to these men for a long time. He worked with Java on several big budget projects, and he's been close with Spaceman and his family since his early 20s. Gee, I wonder why Spaceman wanted him around. With these being some of the people he's associated with, we can only imagine the other people that he might keep secret in his life. He's a man of wealth, influence, and power. The idea that his friend list and the Me Too list are one and the same, it's definitely in the realm of possibility. Number three, he inspired Home Alone. Leonardo was born on November 11th in 1974 in Los Angeles. He was an only child growing up, and his parents, Irma Lynn and George DiCaprio, have been pretty vocal about his rowdy behavior growing up. From a young age, it was obvious that he was going to do something creative. They recall him constantly running around the house, impersonating people, and doing little sketches for them from time to time. One thing they pointed out, though, was that, that Leo had a tendency to pull stunts on his parents with elaborate traps and contraptions. His antics were first mentioned in the early 90s, while doing an interview with his parents. Coincidentally, a little holiday movie called Home Alone was made not long after that. It's a film starring a kid using elaborate traps, contraptions, and voices to take out the bad guys trying to invade his house. And to trick a pizza guy for some reason, I don't know, that seem always seemed cruel to me. Is this a coincidence? I don't think so. It wouldn't come as any kind of a surprise that some Hollywood hotshot heard this story and molded it into the classic flick that we know now. His parents called them antics. But if Leo did anything even close to Kevin McAllister in that movie, ooh, he has definitely ended some lives. Number two, Don's Plum. No, this entry is not about a man named Don and his obsession with plums. That's gonna be another list. Today we're talking about Leonardo's greatest regret. In 2001, he released a movie titled Don's Plum, starring himself, Tobey Maguire, and several more of his younger male friends. The film has been banned from ever being shown in theaters in the US and Canada. Why? Well, this was basically misogyny the movie. The plot centered around the crew meeting up once a week to discuss their recent romantic escapades and overall life experience. Oh, they also bring a new girl every week and just treat them like absolute garbage. This film is filled with terrible dialogue, graphic depictions of violence against women, with Leo's character even going so far as to threaten a woman with a glass bottle. That particular scene is very intense, but what's more intense is that the dialogue in the scene was improvised by DiCaprio on set. Meaning that behind his calm, quiet demeanor, there may be a truly horrifying man. No normal person would have said the things that he said in that moment, so seriously, check him out. And number one, he's immature. In 2013, Leonardo DiCaprio played a character named Jay Gadsby in the movie adaptation of F. Scott Fitzgerald's 1925 novel, The Great Gatsby. The plot centers around the titular character who has been throwing extravagantly lavish parties at his home without anybody knowing who he actually is. People just show up to the party and never wonder where or who their host is. It would appear that this role was meant for Leo as he's been known to throw a mega bash or two in his time. The problem though is DiCaprio Leo's real life persona is much more immature than his on screen counterpart. According to past partygoers, Leo has been known to go hard. While he's never taken any illicit substances, he really likes that no no juice mixed with a little bit of OJ. His behavior has been erratic, and he's apparently very easily excitable. This is unfortunate to hear, as Leo is normally very well spoken, and with being an active member in the climate change community, you'd think he'd have like the mentality of a seven year old Harvard grad, but instead, he's apparently more of a Kyle, mentally speaking. If you know, you know. At number 10, we have Jia Kim and Sang Hun Lee. The two starred alongside each other in the new spin-off series, XO Kitty. Spoiler alert if you haven't watched it yet, they both played the semi-potential love interests of the main character, Kitty, and their performances and respective characters were well received by viewers. It became quite the story when they revealed that they are actually siblings in real life. In a podcast, Jia shared how she first received notice to audition for the show, which she then shared forward to her younger brother, sang -hun. She was already in the running to play Yuri, while sang -hun forgot about it altogether and only had three days left until the audition's deadline. Luckily for him, his sister pestered him to get it done, and the rest is history. Jia Kim was actually a given stage name that she picked, and she was auditioning from LA while her brother still lived in Korea. The odds of them both being cast was slim to none, but they made it happen. At number 9, we have Nick Jonas and Priyanka Chopra. The couple surprised us all when they welcomed their first 
first baby into the world last year. This came as a shock because these news came out of nowhere. In 2021, during the Jonas Brothers family roast, Priyanka joked about how they were expecting, but little did viewers know she was actually telling the truth. The birth came via surrogate, which is how they were able to conceal any and all pregnancy news so easily from the world. They welcomed a little girl named Malti Marie and couldn't be happier to their new addition. On a joint statement shared on both stars social media accounts, it read, We are overjoyed to confirm that we have welcomed a baby via surrogate. We respectfully ask for your privacy during this special time as we focus on our family. Thank you very much. They received tons of praises and congratulations from fans and other celebrity friends of theirs. Baby Malti had a bit of a rough start upon her first few hours as a newborn as she had to remain in the ICU or intensive care unit for 100 days. Fortunately, that is all she needed as she was then taken home and has been growing healthy ever since. Priyanka would often post pictures of their daughter but made sure to cover her face entirely. That was until January this year when she made her first public appearance at the Hollywood Walk of Fame ceremony. Nick and his brothers Joe and Kevin were anointed their own plaques along the tourist driven road. Next on the list we have Elon Musk and Grimes. Okay, so we all know their first kid's name is X something, or apparently it's pronounced X Ash A12. The internet was up in flames when their poor kid was first announced, but did you know they had another kid? Because I didn't. Their second child, a daughter, was literally born a year later, but this made little to no noise. Maybe it's because her name is more normal compared to her older brother. Her name is Exa Dark Sidereal. I'm gonna be honest, that's kind of a fire name because it sounds like the name of a sci fi character. But Despite this very unique name, Grimes just refers to her as Y. Why? Well, if I told you that by simply asking that answers your question, would you believe me? Because that's literally why. On Twitter, she tweeted, she's why now, or why, or just a question mark, but the government won't recognize that. Curiosity, the eternal question, and such. Meaning, she wants people to question why she's called why. Okay, I've said the word why so many times at this point, the word is no longer real to me. At number seven, we have Macaulay Culkin and Brenda Song. Honestly, it came as quite the shocker when I found out these two were together. But they've been together since at least 2017, and if they're happy, we're happy. They're also very private and only share very little to their social media. So in 2021, when they welcomed their first child, Dakota, into the world, people were very surprised. The only statement they made regarding their firstborn was, we are overjoyed, and that's all that really needs to be said. A year later, Macaulay's brother, actor Kieran Culkin, shared the news about baby number two. Brenda described her and Macaulay's parenting as very hands-on. They don't have a nanny, but they do get help from Brenda's mother often. Brenda shared how she would go to work, her mother and Dakota would come on set for feeding and bonding time. So now with a new baby, they definitely got the hang of it. The actress advised that parenting doesn't have to be about assigning certain chores to each other. They learned that communicating is their top priority as that's the only way you can acknowledge and resolve problems. At number six, we have Florence Pugh and Toby Sebastian. Did you know Florence had a sibling? If you did, how did you even figure that out? Toby Sebastian is her older brother who found his own success in the acting industry. He's best known for his roles on The Game of Thrones and The Music of Silence. He's also a singer and songwriter. A couple of years ago, he came out with a song titled Midnight where he featured his younger sister. The song is a soft duet with a guitar accompaniment. If you're into songs that sound like they play at a bookstore or a cute cafe, I highly recommend it. When asked about collaborating with Florence, he said, we've always grown up collaborating as a family, which is kind of the beauty of this song, and now the video that we've created. So anyone who dares say he featured her simply because of her status, do not listen to them because they clearly don't know what they're talking about. He actually credited their mom for even suggesting the idea in the first place. Within 20 minutes in the studio with no rehearsal came their little song. Number 5. The competitive cast. The cast members in Glee were all relatively unknown before they appeared on the show, and as they begun to become a house household name, their social media pages also started to take off. As Glee increased popularity, so did its stars. When the cast members social media began to rise, they were all poised to dominate emerging platforms, but their competition wasn't always friendly according to the docu-series commentators. Doug Kirkpatrick, who was head of the hair department in season 3, would note that he would often see the actors gathered talking about how many people they acquired as followers and that it quickly became a competition. He would also say, in the beginning, they had to tweet every day and it was Leah. 
who really had the numbers. Journalist Andy Swift would also note that the actors started competing on their social media pages and they almost began to fight about it immediately. So it must have hurt a lot knowing that even in real life they would be in superior to Leah Michelle. Number 4 Peer Pressure One of the most controversial allegations in the documentary hinted that Corey Monteith was sober before his passing but that a co-star encouraged him to drink and it went downhill from there. In the documentary, hair department head Doug Kirkpatrick recalled one of the final times he saw Corey in the troubling story the actor allegedly told him. Doug would say he wasn't drinking, he didn't have any substances in his system and then the very last couple of days I saw him he was different. He was under the influence of alcohol, he said he was at a party, he hadn't been drinking, he wanted to have a drink but knew he shouldn't and he was told by a certain cast member that same night, you know, if you want to have a drink, you should have a drink. I'll be here for you. You can always trust that I'll be here for you. Doug also would go on to add his opinion by saying, in my opinion, you would never say that to someone who is sober. And so that confused him and kind of made him mad and he started drinking because he was given permission by somebody. While Doug did refuse to mention any names, he would choose to keep the alleged Glee member a secret because he wasn't there when it happened and he didn't hear the Glee member say it in person himself. However, Doug would add that Corey resented it but also took the direction and that he believes this was the moment that sent him on the path to self destruction. Mark Salling was largely unknown before he landed the role as Noah Puck Puckerman, who was Finn's best friend and like Corey he was a bit older than the rest of the cast. At the time, it has been said that both Mark and Corey were 26 when Glee premiered. But according to Munch, Salling's age wasn't the only thing that made him stand out among his co stars. Munch would say he was quieter, for sure, and kept to himself because I think he felt more of an adult than the others. Just was, you know, a bit off and he wasn't just a regular young man. He had some issues going on, it seemed obvious. Then a few months after Glee ended its sixth season run in 2015, Salling was arrested for possession of illegal photos and videos that contained younger people on them, a charge he ultimately pleaded guilty as part of a plea deal. He then took his own life on January 30th, 2018, shortly before he was scheduled to be sentenced. Even Glee director of photography Christopher Baffa from seasons 1 to 3 would say Salling's offset behavior didn't jive the person he experienced. But he acknowledged that actors are typically on their best behavior once they get around the crew. How did he get there? He was a great guy. What happened? I don't know. Number 2 forced return. While creator Ryan Murphy now believes Glee should have ended after Corey's passing, at the time he largely left the decision up to Leah Michelle. With various options on the table including a 6 month hiatus or cancelling the show altogether, Leah chose to return to work just 2 weeks after her boyfriend and co-star's passing. Back in 2013, Leah would tell Ellen, I said we have to go back to work, we have to, they're my family. However, many of the cast members interviewed in the docuseries were not supportive of this call. Jody Tanka said, it was only a couple of weeks, all of the actors had just pulled themselves together to get back to work. Everyone was kind of forced to. J.A. Byerly, a rigging gaffer on seasons 1 to 5, said Fox was conscious that Glee was about to cross the 100 episode mark, the traditional threshold for ultra profitable. They wanted a product, so we spit out a project. They were looking for 100 episodes. In October 2013, Glee paid tribute to Corey in The Quarterback, the third episode of season 5, and the episode follows the members of the Glee Club as they cope with their grief in the wake of Finn's passing. Honoring his memory with emotional performances of songs from season, from season of Love, If I Die Young, and Make You Feel My Love. Glee ultimately went on for two more seasons after Corey's passing, but Briarly says he was never far from the cast and crew's minds, and you could always feel an emptiness because Corey wasn't around anymore. And coming in at number one today, we have the Glee Curse. Over the past few years, there's been much talk about the Glee Curse, but the cast seemed to reject this theory. Kyle Birch would say, I remember someone mentioning the Glee Curse to one of the cast members, and they got pretty upset about it because they were like, no, this show is not cursed. Cursed. There is no Glee curse. Eric Greer would add that bad things happen, it's life, and unfortunately with Glee there was more tragedy than any other show, but not everything can be full with sunshine and rainbows. Christopher Baffa would also add that ultimately, those close to Glee want the show to be remembered for spreading inclusivity and positivity, not tragedy. He would also say, I don't think Glee is ever going to outlive the tragedies of some of the cast tensions or some of the things that were said about it, but I'd hate to have those aspects as real 
as they are, take away from the good that was achieved because I do believe that good was achieved. Number 10, iCarly stunt double. If you want to know something that proves the people at Nickelodeon only care about money, I've got a scandal for you that was almost swept under the rug entirely. In 2014, a stunt woman from iCarly claimed that the production ruined her career by recklessly dropping her from far too high above the ground, causing some really gruesome injuries. In a stunt gone wrong, Katina Waters was supposed to be dropped slowly down from the ceiling for an episode of iCarly in 2011. She was supposed to be slowly lowered to the ground while still attached to a wire. Instead, she claims that the person operating the descender machine dropped her without warning and she crashed to the floor. The medical consequences of the incident were pretty horrific. It caused severe injuries to her leg, including fractured bones and torn ligaments. But the long-term effects on her health were even worse for her career. Waters was a highly successful stunt actor who performed in dozens of TV shows and movies, but of course she missed out on a lot of work following the incident. Subsequently, she decided to sue the producer, Schneider's Bakery, plus Nickelodeon and MTV networks for pain, suffering and loss of earnings. And she made the right decision as it later emerged that it wasn't the first time something like that had happened on the show. Number 9. The Gak After seeing countless celebrities being slammed on TV for years, there was an extremely high demand for Nickelodeon to release their iconic gooey green sludge to the public. This led the network to release what they called Gak into toy stores across the country in 1992, much to the delight of 90s kids everywhere. The product wasn't exactly slime that they had on the Nick shows, it was more like a squishy putty that made funny noises when you pressed it between your hands. Kids also loved the name Gak because not only was it onomatopoeia, but it also just sounded like how the product felt. However, the branding turned out to be a highly controversial decision, as the name itself was common street lingo for illicit street substances. In fact, it was literally a term for the substance that goes onto a spoon. The story goes that while someone on the Nick crew was working with the then nameless slime one day, they nicknamed it Gak, which became a naughty inside joke on set because of its meaning. Game show host Mark Summers was in on the joke too, and eventually started saying it live on air, but Nickelodeon's marketing department allegedly had no idea and just cluelessly went along with it. Number 8. The Voice of Dora The network had a really big mess on their hands when Caitlin Sanchez, the teenager who starred on Dora the Explorer until she reached puberty, alleged that when she made the deal with Nickelodeon to voice the iconic character, she was given just 22 minutes to sign the contract without an experienced lawyer. The young star did so under duress, with the alleged promise that she'd receive residuals for her work, plus money from merchandising. This was in 2007, years before Dora the Explorer was established as an $11 billion global brand. So in 2010, Caitlin sued Nickelodeon and MTV networks for making her sign what she believed was a terrible contract that conned her out of millions, specifically citing unpaid work hours, as well as being paid only $40 for promotional appearances. The legal battle made headlines throughout the world thanks to statements made by Caitlyn's attorney that if Nickelodeon refuses to pay up by a certain date, he would expose their humiliating secrets. But the young voice actor ended up settling for $500,000, but then tried to re-sue because she and her family thought that the lawyer acted fraudulently and didn't tell her that most of the settlement would be eaten by taxes and lawyer fees. But to fans, the whole settlement just proved that the network certainly had something to hide. Number 7. Chris Savino Once it was exposed, the massive scandal that was a PR nightmare for Nickelodeon was akin to the network's own version of Harvey Weinstein. In 2017, Nick was forced to fire one of its most prominent showrunners, Chris Savino, over allegations made by at least a dozen women. Savino, who has been in the business since the early 90s, previously worked on such animated shows as Dexter's Laboratory and The Powerpuff Girls, and was the creator of Nick's second highest rated kid show at the time, Loud House, which centers on a boy's life while dealing with a house full of sisters. According to Cartoon Brew, as many as 12 women came forward to accuse Savino of predatory behavior, including unwanted sexual advances and threats of blacklisting after the relationships with co-workers had ended. What's even more disturbing is that the site said that the reports date back at least a decade. One woman said that she didn't accept an offer to work at Nickelodeon simply because Savino worked there. She alleged that when they both worked for Disney, he sent her explicit text messages and photos and once offered her a job in exchange for inappropriate things. And Walker Farrell, the director of both 
Bojack Horseman also came forward with her own Savino horror story from the early 2000s when both of them worked at Cartoon Network. Just goes to show you how cases involving power and inappropriate behavior infect almost every corner of Hollywood. Number 6 Zoe 101 The show was a boarding school set dramedy that hit Nickelodeon in January of 2005. Starring as protagonist Zoe Brooks, Jamie Lynn Spears was reportedly brought on by its creator Dan Schneider, all because she looked a lot like her older sister and superstar Britney Spears. But little did fans know there was actually a scandal brewing behind the set as its star was just 16 when she fell pregnant, which would have been a bombshell for the very PG show. In her memoir, Things I Should Have Said, Jamie Lynn Spears confessed that her team decided that her pop star sister should not be told about her pregnancy because it was too risky. Quote, the entire Spears team was already caught up in my sister's PR difficulties, and everyone around me just wanted to make this issue disappear. From there, her family and management pulled her out of school until they could figure out what to do next, and even took away her phone for fear that the news would get out. As a result, the actress said that even her father stopped talking to her. But once the news was released, Nickelodeon immediately released a statement saying, We respect Jamie Lynn's decision to take responsibility in this sensitive and personal situation. And after wrapping shooting for the fourth season of Zoe 101, the network cancelled the series altogether. Number 5. Will Smith At the Oscars on March 27, 2022, Will Smith would show us all that there was something concerning going on with his mental health and state of being as he exposed his darker side. During Chris Rock's speech, he would opt to make an inappropriate joke about Jada Pinkett's shaved head. The joke clearly didn't sit well with Will as Jada has been suffering from a condition called alopecia. So he took to the stage and smacked Rock across the face. As producers scrambled backstage, Smith would return to his seat and remain there until he accepted his award for best actor for his role in the film King Richard. The internet would then start to explode with their opinions on the matter, and while the Smith family mostly stayed offline, well, except for Jada, the Academy would end up banning Will from attending the ceremony for 10 years, though he can still be nominated and win an Oscar. After the ceremony, Will would make an official apology to Chris, and he would then enter into a rehabilitation facility to help him work on his mental health. Number 4. Sydney Sweeney On August 27, Sydney Sweeney would take to her Instagram to post some images of her mother Lisa's western themed 60th birthday celebration and would expose her family with photos that showed some of the relatives wearing Make America Great Again hats and Blue Lives Matter t-shirts. While the actress did not appear to make any political statements herself, while most people started to go crazy in the actor's comments, one person claiming that the actress exposed her family's political views, another asked why she was kicking it with people wearing blue Lives Matter merch. Sydney would then later come out to say, You guys, this is wild. An innocent celebration for my mom's milestone 60th birthday party has turned into an absurd political statement, which was not the intention. Please stop making assumptions. Much love to everyone and happy birthday, mom. However, you can't really ask your fans to stop making assumptions when there's nothing really to assume. And no matter what the occasion is, it's never okay to wear any of this merchandise items. And each of her family was wearing these because it was a country themed party but hate isn't country. Number 3. Kris Jenner Roughly 6 months after Kanye West's feud with his ex-wife Kim Kardashian started, in September Kanye would go after the reality TV star and this time he would drag Kris Jenner into things and confirm that she was really the one who released Kim's tape. After Kanye hopped back onto his platform after months of disappearing, he would share several explosive messages towards Kim and in the process he would express his disapproval towards Kim's parenting styles as he accused her of playing games with their four children. In Kanye's post, he would also claim that he wanted to take control over his kids in their future by declaring, My kids are going to Donda. They are not going to Sierra Cannon. Foretelling Chris to grab her mother effing popcorn. Things would then take another turn when Kanye started to point out that Chris Jenner encourages her daughters, mainly Kim and Kylie, to appear in adult magazines and release their infamous tapes. As he was scared, Chris would make his own kids 
participate in the same endeavors in the future. Number two, Amber Heard. 2022 was a big year for Amber Heard as it would be the year the star would crash and burn after all of her lies were exposed. While Amber was hoping her dark past wouldn't catch up to her, it certainly did and when her biggest secret was exposed after she tried to ruin Johnny Depp's career while Amber was trying to claim that she was a public figure representing domestic abuse. However, during one point of the trial, Amber's lawyer, Ben Rottenborn, presented his opening statements where he presented a Milani Cosmetics all-in-one correcting kit to the jury and claimed that Amber had used this very concealer and correcting kit to hide and cover her bruises. However, that makeup brand wasn't even out and it exposed Amber's lies by saying in a statement it couldn't be true because their product wasn't even available until after Amber and Johnny had gotten a divorce. In the statement, Ben said this is what she used. She became very adept at it. Amber and Johnny got divorced in 2016 which was before Milani's Cosmetic even launched that specific product as it didn't come out until 2017, which means Amber lied. Number one, Olivia Wilde. For months, the headlines have been filled with an alleged onset feud between Olivia Wilde and Florence Pugh. On set of Olivia's film, Don't Worry Darling, and rumors didn't paint Olivia to be as charming or sweet as we were all led to believe in the past. Despite much of the cast attempts to dampen the rumors, the tension between between the two were apparently so bad that some crew members even started to claim that they had a screaming match on set. And Olivia's former nanny would even say that apparently in the beginning, Florence and Harry were close and it drove Olivia nuts. And she complained to her fiance, Jason Sudeikis. And then when she left Jason for Harry and kept taking Harry away from set, this drove Florence nuts. And then Olivia got into a feud with Shia LaBeouf before hiring Harry Styles to replace him. And she claimed that she fired Shy to keep Florence safe, but then Shy would release their text messages where you could see Olivia making fun of Florence, and you can also see why Shy quit because he was done with Olivia's nonsense. Number 10, he feels no pain. Leonardo DiCaprio is an incredible actor and has been known to keep his cool on set even when things go horribly wrong. In the film Django Unchained by pediatric enthusiast Quentin Tarantino, DiCaprio played a plantation owner named Calvin Candy. In one particular scene, Leo is so deep in character that he slams his hand down hard on a dining table in anger. Moments later, his hand is gushing blood as he had just come down right on top of a wine glass that was not supposed to break. Despite his hand being sliced open though, he not only stayed in character, but it was reported that he barely seemed to be in any pain during the ordeal. He just got stitches and he kept filming. As someone who's almost lost their finger before, your hand being ripped open does not feel good at all. It's extremely painful. The only logical explanation to this is Leo has used his million to get some kind of a nerve blocker, allowing him to no longer feel pain. This would explain his ability to stay calm and in character in even the toughest of situations. It's either that or I'm just a wuss and don't handle pain. Well, I don't know, tomato potato. Number nine, he's poisoning the ozone layer. Leonardo DiCaprio has been open about his views on climate change for a long time, even taking time during his Oscar and Golden Globe speeches to drop some climate change knowledge on Hollywood and the world. It turns out that he may not understand the logistics of how jet fuel works. You see, Leo is a frequent flyer when he's traveling, but he's usually in his own private jet. Despite being a climate change activist, he flies across the planet in what looks like an expensive plane with a hefty fuel tank. On top of that, Leo drives a normal car and his his massive house is powered on the same electricity as the rest of us. If he was really trying to save the planet, he'd make more radical changes. He's rich. Why hasn't he installed solar panels on his roof and gone off the grid? Well, because secretly he doesn't care. He's happy to drive and fly when he pleases. Come on, Leo, just aim a tank of fossil fuels at the sky and let her loose. Might as well. Number eight. He paid the Academy for his Oscar. In 2016, Leonardo DiCaprio finally won an Oscar for Best Actor in a leading role for his performance in the film The Revenant. He played a character named Hugh Glass, a frontierman on a fur trading expedition in the 1820s who fights for survival after being mauled by a bear and left for dead by his own hunting team. His performance was pretty good, but honestly there wasn't a ton of dialogue from DiCaprio as he spends most of the movie alone in the woods. He, he grunts and screams in pain a lot 
lot though, and uh, apparently that was good enough for Best Actor. When you compare Leo's performance to that of his fellow nominees from that year though, there is a very clear difference in quality. The other contenders that year were Eddie Redmayne in The Danish Girl, Matt Damon in The Martian, Brian Cranston for Trumbo, and Michael Fassbender for Steve Jobs. These performances were arguably 10 times more compelling than Leo's, especially when you consider his past. Leo has been nominated for an Oscar seven times throughout his career, with his first one coming in 1994 for his role alongside Johnny Depp in What's Eating Gilbert Grape. If you've never seen that movie, watch it, and you'll realize that he got snubbed. He was nominated for his performance in Wolf of Wall Street, The Aviator, Blood Diamonds, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Any of those should have guaranteed him the win, but he lost time and time again. In 2016, it felt like the Academy was either forced or paid to give him the award, because not only was his reaction minimal following his name being announced, but he had a whole climate change speech like ready to go. I don't know, that's just it's a little sus, just a little. Number nine, his preference in age. It's no secret that Leo's dating life has been filled with mainly younger women. In 2022, someone took the time to deep dive into Leo's past and created a literal chart of former lovers as well as their ages compared to his own. According to the chart, between the ages of 24 and 44, Leo has been in eight serious relationships and all eight women were significantly younger than him when they met. At 24, he met Giselle Bunchen, who was six years younger than him. His next girlfriend, Bar Rafley, named after the place her parents met, was 20 when she started dating Leo, who was 30. Between all eight women, the oldest ones made it to 25 before Leo called it quits. Now there is no way that this is a coincidence. Three women were dumped after they turned 25. It's like Leo had some kind of a sick need for the person he's with to be generations behind him. He's never come right out and talked about his preferences, but like, why would he? How would that conversation even go? Yeah, yeah, I keep a minimum of uh, 20 years younger than me and the number grows by one every year. Yeah. Gross. Number six, his mental health. Leo is one of those people who classifies themselves as a method actor. For instance, in a famous scene in Wolf of Wall Street, Leo's character took too many happy pills and has to drag himself across the floor in a haze of substance and spit. To prepare for this role, he interviewed several people with similar experiences and he would rehearse his physicality over and over again before the scenes. Now, while that's not a great example, this one is. Anytime Leo has to play a character with some kind of an emotional detachment, or mental health issue, he's been known to completely isolate himself from the world. For his role in Shutter Island, he played a detective sent to an asylum on a remote island to investigate the mysterious disappearance of one of the inmates. The film is wonderfully dark and full of mystery, right up to the final reveal, which I won't spoil just in case you want to watch Shutter Island. To prepare for this performance, Leo isolated himself in an apartment for three months and had it set up like a police precinct. He even hired a ghostwriter to give him fake crimes to solve so he could really step into the mentality of the role. While this may work for many people, the facts are that Leo has become more reserved over the years and he speaks with a very low volume and tone now. Did all that isolation make him go crazy for real? Probably. Number 5. The Rock Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez wouldn't be the only one exposed during the 2023 Grammy show this year as Pan, who won a spot to be a seat filler at the event, explained throughout the show her job was to fill seats so no empty seats were shown on camera. Well, sometimes this can be really difficult cult for the seat fillers as some celebrities just refuse to let them sit next to them or tell them that their partners or friends are actually sitting in them and that they'll be back soon and to not take their seats. It wasn't Pan's first time attending an award show, and the Grammys would be the first time that she actually got to sit among the stars. When on the floor, Pan had to follow many rules, which included her not talking to celebrities who didn't engage in conversation with her first. During her time on the floor, she actually broke that rule when she decided to make the opportunity to talk to The Rock by asking him if the seat next to him was taken. Then Rock then kind of gave her the cold shoulder, like many celebrities who don't want to sit next to someone random and told her it was. Number 4. Chris Stapleton In 2022, Natalie Bickle was one of the lucky 150 winners of the seat lottery for the Grammy Awards. While the seat fillers fill empty seats so they can give the illusion of filled seats throughout the night, it becomes a fun moment of musical chairs for any of the lucky winners. While moving around the floor, the fillers are not allowed to initiate in any conversation with any celebrities, but you can have a conversation with them if they talk to you first. While Natalie got close to many 
movie stars. She even got to talk to some people at Chris Stapleton's table when she said that she took his seat at his table when he was getting an award. While she was at the table, some of his entourage members did talk to her for a bit. However, when Chris went back to claim his seat, didn't acknowledge Natalie whatsoever. Number three, Justin Bieber. Not only did Natalie Bickle note that she had an awkward moment with Chris Stapleton when he returned back to his seat, but she also noted how sweet Justin Bieber's friendship really is with Billie Eilish and how she loved watching Justin react to Billie's performances. In her interview with the insider, Natalie said that whenever Billie Eilish was performing, Justin Bieber was the first to stand up and give her a standing ovation. Natalie then recalled the moment was actually really neat and she found the overall gesture really adoring and sweet, as Billie has been a very outspoken Bieber fan for years. And Justin has even been really protective over Billie as he knows how hard it can be for kids entering into the industry. So it's really sweet to know that he actually really cares about her and wants to make her experience better than his was. Coming number two, we do have Billie Eilish. Apparently being a seat filler at the Grammys guarantees that you will leave with some great stories to tell your mates. And this is exactly what happened to Terry George, who ended up being able to sit with Billie Eilish. In the process, he actually ended up getting mistaken for the singer's granddad. The former secret millionaire star told Yorkshire Live that fans made the assumption based on the fact that he was cheering on her win. Terry then went on to say, I went to the Grammys as a seat filler and ended up sitting next to Billie Eilish when she was winning her awards and it's probably the best seat in the house. It's what I call a golden seat, really. Terry would then later reveal that Billie is actually just as sweet in real life that we all expected her to be when he said, as her and her brother made him feel like he was a part of the group. As when she won the award, both grabbed his hand before she headed to the stage to claim her award and when she returned, Terry asked her what she was going to do if she won the next award, to which Billie said, oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm going to do. And coming in at number one today, we have Olivia Rodrigo. This year, the Grammys wasn't really filled with any drama, which is actually really boring to see. However, some seat fillers did share all the fun memories they made while attending the show. One of the night's seat winners, Cameron Carlson from North Dakota, even got to fist bump Harry Styles. At one point during the night too, Cameron would note that he was seated on the right side of the venue at a table behind Olivia Rodrigo. And he explained that the award recipient, Harry Styles, would frequently pass by his seat and even did this little victory lap before he fist bumped him. And then when he went to perform, at one point he noticed that James Corden and Olivia Rodrigo were dancing. And that's when he noticed Olivia was jamming out a little too hard and she actually knocked down her chair in the process. Cameron would then say, I was like, okay, I'm here to be a hero. So he ran over, picked up her chair, Olivia thanked him, and even gave him a half hug and he found the altercation to be like very crazy. Coming in at number 10, we have Corey Monteith's substance struggles. According to Frederick Robertson, during the early Glee days, Corey Monteith was really concerned about maintaining a clean image. When he got the role, he knew he was supposed to be a good kid. And he didn't want his past getting out. With Glee being the beginning of his success, he didn't want the world to know that he was struggling with alcohol and substances. While his struggles may have been kept a secret to the public, Corey had no problem with disclosing them to his close friends and roommate, Justin Neal. In 2008, Corey would admit to Justin about his substance use in the past and that he was trying to stay sober as it was a big part of his life. According to the docuseries, Corey started skipping school to do substances at the age of 13 and he went on to attend a dozen schools, including programs for troubled teens and often stole large sums of cash from his family. At the age of 19, his mother and friends staged an intervention, leading him to enter into a rehab program in 2001. It wasn't until Glee's second season that he went public with his struggles, admitting in an interview that he wanted to share his past so people didn't assume he was exactly like his all star character, Finn Hudson, by saying, I feel like I had to step in at some point and relate to people with my experience and where I come from. Corey's publicist, Leslie Diana, also said he wanted to go public to help others as Corey wanted to show them that you could come out on the other side and do well in life. Number nine, Corey and Leah's relationship. Lee stars Leah Michelle and Corey Monteith didn't go public with their relationship until 2012. But according to Garrett Greer,
career, an assistant to the executive producer on seasons one and two. They first got together years earlier in 2009. He would go on to say they had been an item before the show premiered, and during season one, or part of it anyway, Leah and Corey were involved, and then later the relationship came back full force. Later, Garrett would go on to describe Leah as a narcissist, and then would go on to note that the other members on the Glee set also didn't think they were a good match. Even the set decorator, Barbara Munch, would make a comment about the relationship when she said it seemed odd because it was about her always, and I think he just accepted that. Doug Kirkpatrick, head of hair department in season three, would also go on to say that Corey and Leah's relationship also had a negative side effect on Corey's mental state. And he said a lot of Corey's confusion had a lot to do with his relationship with Leah Michelle. I don't know if she was a friend. I think she was involved with him because he was on a TV show. Patrick Chinzel, a key assistant location member, would also ask the ultimate question if that Leah was good for Corey, and then he would go on to say, I hope so, I would think so. I know other people who say maybe. That wasn't necessarily true. It seems like people didn't really understand why Corey was dating Leah, and many felt like she wasn't good enough for him. Hey my little peaches, are you liking this video so far? If so, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Coming in at number 8, we have Naya Rivera and Leah Michelle's hated each other. If you were a fan of Glee, or you watched just one episode, then you would know it's no secret that Naya, who played cheerleader Santana, and Leah, who played the dorky Glee girl no one liked, Michelle, were at odds most of the time, but you may not know they were at odds in real life as well. Naya herself, who passed away in an accident while she was boning in 2020, wrote about the friction in her 2016 memoir, Sorry Not Sorry, and would write, One of the Glee writers said that Leah and I were like two sides of the same battery, and that about sums us up. We are both strong willed and competitive, not with each other, but everyone. And that's not a good mixture. In the documentary, Naya's father, George, spoke of the pair's rivalry and he would say there was always a fight between them. Always. Everybody knew. Everybody saw it. They hated each other, but at the same time respected each other's talent. George would also note that Naya even complained about Leah to production and it would cause Naya to be briefly let go from the cast. Number seven, Naya Rivera's dad's warning. Naya Rivera's dad, George, recalled the last time. He spoke to his daughter, which happened to be via FaceTime shortly before she passed away. George would go on to say, I get a sinking feeling because we've been boating forever. I was on FaceTime with her, trying to talk her through the pitfalls. First of all, I said, Naya, you're on a platoon boat. That's not a boat. Why are you on a platoon boat? I said, Do not jump off that effing boat. If you got an anchor, you can anchor it, but do you know how to anchor it? We went through a couple of interactions like that, and then the FaceTime call hung up. And that was the last time I talked to her. After he received a call from authorities about his daughter, George would begin a multi-day drive from Knoxville, Tennessee to Ventura County, California, but even though he considered his daughter was a really good swimmer, he instinctively feared the worst by saying, I knew immediately when I got the phone call in Knoxville that it was over. You don't find a drifting five-year-old child asleep on the boat at the end of the lake without his mother and have any hope. I had no hope. And speaking about his grief, he would also say, you don't process it. I don't know what everyone else does, but for me, it's as fresh today as it was two years ago. He would also later add that Naya knew she was on a really good show with lots of tragedies and that he didn't know if you could equate that to fame, but he thought it had something to do with it. Number Number six, fame. Corey Monteith's former roommate, Neil, said that Corey struggled with fame as Glee's popularity skyrocketed and the show's fandom intensified by saying there was a period where it seemed Corey was getting more and more isolated. He just got to the point where he just hated fame. He said, I'm just so tired, I want to rest a bit, I'm sick of singing these songs, and I remember him specifically saying, I wouldn't wish fame on my worst enemy. Neil then continued to say, I'd seen the fame, but I didn't realize how hard it was until then. I think with that level of fame, you lose sight of who you are to every single person. He wasn't Corey anymore, he was now Finn. We just knew he wasn't in the best place. Neil would also add in the second episode, in the documentary The Price of Glee, that Corey became frustrated with Glee's demanding schedule and wanted more freedom with his career as he had to turn down movies and he was becoming more erotic and isolated. However, Neil did know as much as he didn't like fame, he knew how lucky he was and never took that for granted. At number five, we have Lady.
Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga definitely knows how to make heads turn. And before she gave us the iconic song, A Poker Face and Born This Way, the singer was actually a stripper. After dropping out of NYU, she moved out of her parents' house and to support herself, she began working as a waitress during the day and a stripper at night. Gaga turned to stripping because her personality was bold and strong and her sense of sexuality and her love for the human body made her feel confident. Gaga has even revealed to the World's Fabulous magazine that her act was wild and she would wear black leather while dancing to rock and roll. She's also stated that she made more money stripping than she did waiting tables. Number 4 we have Javier Bardem. According to Javier, he started stripping as a joke, however he got hired to do it again. He stated that while he was performing, it was a disaster and his mother and sister were out in the crowd to support him. On Ellen, Javier would say that he was 20 at the time and after he got hired to perform, he was so nervous that he called up his mom and sister to accompany him to the club. When it was time for Javier to perform, he stated that there was only 3 people in the club. He was embarrassed, however, since he was a performer and he gave his word to do the show, he ultimately decided to do the show and became a stripper for the day. And number 3 we have Amber Rose. While some celebrities decide to brush their past right under the carpet, Amber Rose has always chosen to speak her mind away about them. One career Amber has always been very vocal about is the fact that she used to be a stripper. In an interview, she even claimed that she had some of her best times in her life while she was an exotic dancer. And she's even given some words of wisdom for anybody looking to join the field. The multi-talented singer has suggested that as long as anybody's looking to get into the field goes in with their heads up, stays sober, and focuses on making money, then the job will be like any other. She's also advised that anybody who's comfortable with their body should give it a try right away. After stripping, Amber would then move on to modeling and then to acting. And number two, we have Trina. American singer Trina never wanted to do anything with music. So after high school, she wanted to pursue a career in real estate. However, when she accompanied her friends to shoot a music video, another musician noticed her and asked her if she ever wanted to give music a try. Trina would initially decline, however, she would later agree and the rest is history. Now before Trina became a musician, she has admitted that she tried dancing for money but quickly realized it was never for her. Her career barely lasted a week before she decided to officially opt out. And at number one today, we have Kat Stacks. After being born in Venezuela, Kat Stacks would relocate to the United States when she was just eight years old. She would then grow into the sensational rapper and hip hop musician she is today. Apart from her music career, Kat has had a pretty controversial lifestyle and she's even tried her hand at exotic dancing. In an interview with 97.9 FM radio, Kat revealed that she was a stripper at the age of and she recounts her time in her as a stripper as traumatizing and that she just did whatever she could to get by. Since entering into the industry, the rapper has never been short to surprise the world with scandals and controversies.